this Monday, September 19th, 2011 edition of the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Aaron Dyke, sitting in for Alex Jones while he's on a well-deserved day off. Coming up in the show, we have an interview with author and researcher Alfred Adesk, and then later with Dr. Russell Blaylock, and we're going to examine some of the vaccine propaganda and the big push for Gardasil, which has become a major campaign issue. But first, tonight in the headlines, Ron Paul won the California straw poll with a dominating 44.9% of the vote. Rick Perry got 29%. Mitt Romney got 8.8%. And the others dropped off from there. It was just an absolutely dominant victory. Ron Paul gave his victory speech in Los Angeles on Saturday, and he highlighted really some important issues, the natural rights, uh, the right to sell raw milk or eggs to neighbors, as well as stuff like gold and silver he covers all the time. And yet, questions have been raised about was he cheated out of winning in the Texas straw poll, even though he's demonstrated he can win a million dollars in one day, as he did the other day on Constitution Day. Paul Joseph Watson writes, Ron Paul is riding high again after his California straw poll victory yesterday, but some Paul supporters question why the Texas straw poll was canceled for, quote, lack of interest of the candidates. And this is because Mitt Romney said he wouldn't participate, and clearly I, I think there's reason to believe they didn't want to demonstrate another Ron Paul victory. We've seen how the media can ignore him and edit him out of his own poll showings. Let's take a look at the cumulative results for all the straw polls for the 2012 primary season. We see here that Ron Paul, over the course of 14 straw polls, including the results of the September 17th California straw poll, is a cumulative percentage of 19.74%, significantly above Mitt Romney at 14%, Michelle Bachman at 8%, who bought her Iowa straw poll results, Herman Cain at 7%. Rick Perry's in eighth place with less than 4%. Now, he's been in all the straw polls, but then again, why has he become the media's self-proclaimed leader here in this primary season? There isn't a reason except that the establishment has promoted him as their favorite candidate he, because he went to Bilderberg, because he pimps for big government left and right. And later, of course, we're going to cover how he pimped for the Merck Gardasil vaccine using a government mandate to dangerously force girls to take a shot that they probably don't even need. Now in other news, the quieter but in many ways worse news, QE3 is destined to be continued. Kurt Nemo wrote about this today. Operation Twist, Fed ready for QE3 after two unsuccessful runs of QE1 and QE2. Unless we see significant improvements in economic data over the next couple of months, we deem it likely that the Fed will initiate QE3, buying either, either more government bonds or mortgages. And they go on to say this could happen by the end of 2011 or the early part of 2012. Now we know QE3 only drives inflation and it further gives a discriminatory preference to the banks who can invest and lend with this money but they're not lending to Main Street. They're not helping employment. They're only sending these jobs offshore, as we've covered in depth. We're going to keep an eye on this, but more just troubling signs ahead. In other news, America's homeless crisis washes up at Obama's birthplace. That is Hawaii hiding its extreme homelessness rate. There's over 4,000 homeless people in a population of less than 1 million making it, giving it the third highest ratio of homelessness in the nation. Despite its aloha reputation, Hawaii currently has the third highest rate of homelessness of any state behind Oregon and Nevada. Now, when the poverty line has reached 15% nationally, Hawaii also has 96,000, almost 100,000, who are considered hidden homeless. That is, they stay with friends, they live in temporary accommodations, or they're simply squatting. Then another 260,000 people, that's one in five in Hawaii, are at risk of homelessness. That's more than a third of the population living at or near the poverty line or even well below. Just absolutely shameful as Barack Obama continues to pimp for his job bills and, and the rest of it. Last week we reported how the NFL is now taking part in TSA-style pat-downs uh, whenever people visit the game, they'll have to be 
run through security. This has been going on for years, really, but this form of it has been going on since the Super Bowl. No one complained then, uh, but yet there's a poll in USA Today today. Agree with the NFL's head-to-toe pat-downs this season, and more than 85% of people disagree that this will improve safety. The NFL wants to search fans from head to toe to improve safety, agree or disagree. 47% disagree and say it's an invasion of privacy. Another 38% say they're just going to stay home and watch it on TV and refuse to attend these games. Uh, now that's a great sign. It shows the public is not behind this ridiculous security theater, which will not keep anyone safer. It's only part of what we know Homeland Security has been talking about for years, rolling out the style to checkpoints on the roads, to bus and train stations, but also to sporting events, also to shopping malls, and all the rest of it. Just a terrible sign of the police state to come. And now young kids going to football games for entertainment are going to learn that not only is there bread and circuses in this fascist state, but for the game to even go on, you have to go through a security ritual. You have to submit to this system. I hope everyone takes Alex's call to boycott the NFL, its sponsors, and even watching it on TV very seriously. As we've reported in August, the negative view of the federal government has hit a new all-time high, but in fact, a lot of that anger has been targeted at the economic collapse and the absolute handover of power to Wall Street. But now, here in September, people have taken it to the streets. Now, not all these groups are constitutionalists or have the right solutions, but people have at least begun to identify the right enemy, and that's the bankers located symbolically and many of them physically on Wall Street. to fight for our country and to keep it, you know, true to serving its people. And when it doesn't do that, it's immoral not to stand up and say something. I'm here myself as a free individual to humanize the markets and to have true participatory democracy, bottom-up democracy, and to make Wall Street hear the sound of what democracy means. What kind of power? People power! Wall Street, it crashes. And, uh, you know, people starve, people lose their jobs, things like that. We're very angry at Wall Street. It's the heart of capitalism, American capitalism especially. That's why we're here today at Wall Street. There's no reason to not be peaceful. We just want to get a point across. We're just trying to let people know what's going on and why we're here for it. Now, the protesters have stated that their goal was to make this a Tahir Square, like an Egypt or other Arab Spring revolution. The only difference is these aren't the puppet governments. People are starting to focus on the actual real rulers. And that's why cops lock down Wall Street from Day of Rage protesters. That's why no right to protest in America, occupation of Wall Street thwarted thanks to ignorant police. Well, they weren't ignorant. They were taking orders from the bankers themselves who did not want people able to express themselves freely under the First Amendment. Uh, now, an interesting caveat to this, I think, is the group Adbusters, uh, who helped organize a lot of this. They put out the blog, Occupy Wall Street, and they said, Dear patriots, rabble-rousers, and revolutionaries, let's get ready to give our Obama our one demand. And they were going to all get together and decide, should it be a demand to end the separation of, Gla or reinstate, rather, the Glass-Steagall Act? Should it be to outlaw flash trading or even put a tax on financial transactions no instead they said they think they're going to appeal to obama to start a commission to end the moneyed corruption that takes place in wall street well they've got the right enemy as i've said but that solution is a joke just reinstating the glass steagall act which allows these investment houses to put derivatives on the back of sort of ordinary commercial banking would go a long way to undoing this damage and now we take you to our first guest, Alfred Adask. He's been a researcher, an activist, an author, and a whole lot more. Uh, Mr. Adask, thank you for joining us. Glad to be here. Uh, so you could tell us some about your uh, background and, and the case that brought you really deeply into the heart of this whole system. The case that brought me deeply into the system was back in 1983, which was a divorce and I suffered what I thought was a great injustice, and I became a student of the legal system, and I've stayed there ever since. But 
the case that's really made a big difference is I was one of seven defendants sued for the manufacture and distribution of a controlled substance. And I was added, the, the case started in 2001. I was the last defendant added in 2004. Six, I was added. Um, the controlled substance was colloidal silver. It's an inexpensive antibiotic. And I didn't have anything to do with manufacturing. I was just fiduciary for a trust, at least a little bit of equipment to one of the corporations that manufactured the product. This was instigated by the FDA. And we were being sued. Each defendant was being threatened with fines of $25,000 a day. That's $9 million a year. That's a nice chunk of change, and it absolutely focuses your mind. And it, you know, you, you start defending against a lawsuit where you're being sued by the attorney general of Texas for nine million dollars a year. Um, you pay attention. You know, it absolutely it focuses. Well, I started reading the relevant drug laws, and when we read the Texas Health and Safety Code, section four three one point zero zero two, subsection fourteen, it defined the meaning of drug. And it says in part the drug means, and then it, uh, articles, uh, yada, 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 in the mitigation, treatment, or prevention of diseases in man or other animals. And the first time I saw the phrase man or other animals, I thought, why, you damn fools. You don't know what you're writing there. When you, It's not man or animals, it's man or other animals. They are defining drugs on the presumption that the people are animals. And I thought it was inadvertent the first time I saw it. And then it turns out later on in the same definition, the word man or other animals turns up a second time. And I began to realize, realize this isn't an accident. We looked at the federal definition of drugs, 21, uh, Title 21, Section 321G1. And again, same definition refers to man or other animals. Well, I'm a student of the Bible, and I understand that under Genesis 1, 26 through 28, it says, on the sixth day, God created man in his image and gave man dominion over the animals. And I understood right away, as soon as I saw this, I thought, if they're going to treat us as animals, they're doing it in violation of our freedom of religion. If you are a member of the Jewish faith or the Christian faith, and probably even the Muslim faith, if you are... I, I, I assume that the Muslim faith has a similar, something similar to Genesis at their foundation. I don't know that to be a fact. But certainly for Jews and Christians, if, if the government is treating you as an animal, it's an absolute violation of your freedom of religion, which says you can't be an animal. Six days says God created man in his image, man only, in God's image, and gave man dominion over the animals. By definition, I can't be a Christian and an animal. People can't be a Jew and an animal. <clears throat> we this stuff has been religion. done on purpose. Uh, they've put it in global governance treaties, Agenda yep. 21, etc., yep. uh, where they want to give rights to animals and, and take away our sovereign rights under the Bill yep. of Rights Constitution, but really, as you point out, the natural rights, God-given. Yep. That's exactly right. Um, it be, we think we, the, earliest, the earliest instance we've found is 1906 Pure Food and Drug Act. And you can look in the Section 6 of the 1906 Pure Food and Drug Act. You can put it into the web. You can, you can Google it. 1906 Pure Food and Drug Act. Look for Section 6. You'll see the phrase, man or other animals, to define both food and drugs. That means for over a century, the government has operated on the presumption that we are animals rather than men and women. And this is powerful and it's important because this country started with the Declaration of Independence, which says uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That's second sentence. Third sentence says that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, meaning that the purpose of government as envisioned by the founding fathers was to secure to every man, woman, and even unborn child their God-given unalienable rights. But those rights only accrue to men and women. They do not accrue to animals. And the government has no obligation to secure those unalienable rights to animals. Now, we advanced this defense. I devised religious freedom defense. And I was pretty sure that it'd have to stop them. And in the end, it did. Um, it had, so far as I know, it's never been done before. But the reason they, they just dropped the case after investing six years and nearly a half million dollars in this case, the attorney general of Texas just dropped it 
We, they, they didn't say goodbye. We just didn't hear from them anymore. We haven't heard from them now since 2007, going on four years since we've heard from them. Um, the reason is because the war on drugs is based on the presumption that the people are animals. If this goes to court and someone were able to prove in court and get a jury and especially an appellate court to agree that people aren't animals, there goes the war on drugs. If the war on drugs disappears, it laid the foundation for much of the modern police state. The modern police state would disappear if this argument went to court. The police state gave us the prison industrial complex. I've been told 70% of the people in the, uh, in the federal penitentiaries are there on drug-related crimes. That whole thing collapses if we can pull this definition out from under them. Uh, the whole, that, that whole, all of the, the police state, the, the prisons, the rest of that, it's built in a large degree on a mere definition that's been laying here in the books. Again, we traced this back to 1906. And so far as I know, I'm the first one to read the law, first layman at least, to read the law and understand what it meant. The but but I think the implications go back even further because I've read only some really of Hegel and the other early psychologists from the 1800s who really tried to change that paradigm too uh, because they couldn't figure out how to manipulate the psyche of man so through psychology they decided to use the condition response and the other related mechanisms to treat man as an animal and that rolled over into education and all the 20th century systems to control us from the top down uh, what is your take on that sir well i agree with you 100 percent and one of the other classic examples is the government's stress on the theory of evolution. The theory of evolution was pushed at the, at the American people from the early 1900s, right about the same time that the Food and Drug Act defined the people to be animals. Um, they, insofar as people accept the theory of evolution, they have to accept the idea that they are mere animals. They're not surprised by the concept. But what they don't get, what they don't understand is insofar as you accept the theory of evolution, you have to accept that the government is your master and you are nothing but livestock. On the other hand, if you want to go back to the creation theory out of the Bible, under those circumstances, you can be a sovereign and the government is your servant rather than your master. There are political, powerful, powerful political implications in the, in the theory of evolution. Most people think, oh, it's just science. No, it's not. It's big time politics. And it's why government wants that theory of evolution. They want people taught and they want people to believe. And of course, it justifies the eugenics world state and the rest of it. Uh, now, you got into how they were targeting you for selling colloidal silver. Right. Uh, what about the other silver currency? Uh, the other things like raw dairy they've started trying to restrict. Same what thing, happened to I mean, our natural right you know, to put things in our body as we see fit? You don't have a natural right if you're livestock. If you're an animal, where's your natural right? You have no more rights. You have no more intrinsic rights as an animal than a chicken on a Tyson poultry processing plant. They can trim your little beak off and put you in there where you're just elbow to elbow with 100,000 other chickens, and if you don't like it, too bad for you. You don't have any significant rights as an animal. The only thing that causes the government to give us any respect at all is since we are a very peculiar animal in that we understand how to use firearms. And the government, so long as we have firearms, they have a very serious problem with this particular group of animals. But if they can get that away at, at that point in time, you're like an unarmed chicken, again, in the poultry processing plant. You're not headed for a good, uh, for a happy ending. Yeah, but they've had a headache disarming Americans, at least. Oh, yeah, I, I, don't, don't give up your guns, no matter what happens. Don't give up your guns, but don't give up your dictionaries either. You know, I've been telling people for some time, if you want to stop this system, you need to own at least as many dictionaries as you own firearms. And you need to become astute. You need to become very qualified at dealing with the English language. And insofar, if you become fluent in the English language, you can hold these people at bay. Again, we ran them off. They'd invested half a million dollars in six years in this case. I understood I could read. That's the only reason we stopped them. I could read. I understood what man or other animals meant. And I'll tell you another thing. It's evidence that faith works. You know, we stop these people with a freedom of religion defense. And it's evidence that it's not just mythology. There's foundation. There is power 
if you can get into the Bible and actually understand it, there's arguments there, there's evidence there. And uh, if you can use it properly, you can make these people back off. Now, it's not easily done, and it's not necessarily for everyone, but the point is, it can work. Well, the other thing, too, is not only is man not an animal, but man should never be the ultimate authority because there's always conflicts of interest and the rest of it. That's Absolutely. in the Old Testament, too. Absolutely. So all the more reason for our individual rights. Uh, well, we're going to cut it off there. We could talk for hours, of course. We really appreciate you joining us, Doctor. And the best website is? Uh, Adask.wordpress.com. That's A-D-A-S-K dot WordPress dot com. Amazing. We'll have to have you back up soon. Thank you for joining us. Glad Doctor. to do it. Thanks very much. Okay, that was Alfred Odesk. And we'll be back after this break with more on the HPV vaccine hoax and our other guest, Dr. Russell Blaylock. So stay tuned on the InfoWars Nightly News. The American dream. There's a reason they call it a dream. <laughs> Who's there? cock a doodle do, pal. No, 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 no! I don't have any more money! My job sucks right now! Please! I'll have more money next month! You can't take my house! Is that your signature? It is a private bank owned by private stockholders. A, a, a private bank? Do not let the named federal fool you. If I got this money from the bank, and the bank got it from the Federal Reserve dump tracks, where does the Federal Reserve get their money? They take our property away, just like Thomas Jefferson said they would. Those sons of bitches! It's the greatest theft in human history. Welcome back. Now, in a moment, we have a guest coming up, Dr. Russell Blaylock. But first, we have continued controversy over the HPV vaccine comments that Michelle Bogman made during last week's GOP debate. The American Academy of Pediatrics countered her claim that the vaccine causes retardation, saying the medical community issued swift criticism after Republic Rep. Michelle Bogman dragged the safety of the HPV vaccine into the political spotlight saying since the vaccine has been introduced, more than 35 million doses have been administered and it has an excellent safety record. On the other hand, we have the CDC's own statistics, and we're about to get into this with Dr. Blaylock, of over 18,000 adverse reports and many deaths as well. For more on that vaccine controversy, we take you to Rob Dew's investigative piece right now. Is he less conservative than meets the eye? Gardasil has once again entered the presidential debate. First, it was Ron Paul attacking Rick Perry. Forcing 12-year-old girls to take an inoculation uh, to prevent this sexually transmitted disease, this is not good medicine, I, I do not believe. And now it's Michelle Bachman. The governor's former chief of staff was the chief lobbyist for this drug company. The drug company gave thousands of dollars in political donations to the governor. Well, I will tell you that I had a mother last night come up to me here in Tampa, Florida after the debate. She told me that her little daughter took that, uh, took that vaccine, that injection, and she suffered from mental retardation thereafter. Doctors around the country are offering rewards for proof of her claim that one of her friend's daughters is now mentally retarded after receiving the Gardasil vaccine. The former IRS attack dog is now on the defensive. John, is there any science that suggests HPV vaccine can have that effect? Scott, it's so important to separate the politics from the science. What the science says, this is a vaccine that can prevent the virus that causes cancer of the cervix. There are 35 million doses that have been given in the United States since 2006. According to the Centers for Disease Control, the Institute of Medicine, and the American Academy of Pediatrics, there's no link between this vaccine and any kind of mental impairment. 
and the media has once again come to the defense of the vaccine industry. We don't need to start a new sort of controversy. There are no data to indicate that HPV vaccine or any other vaccine has any association with mental retardation. Of course, this has nothing to do with the amount of advertising Big Pharma buys each year. I chose to get my daughter vaccinated. I chose to get my daughter vaccinated when her doctor and I agree that the right time to protect her is now because it's about prevention. Right. Gardasil is the only cervical cancer vaccine that helps protect against four types of HPV. HPV vaccine and other vaccines are wonderfully safe vaccines. So who is Dr. William Schaffner? He is the president of the National Foundation for Infectious Diseases, an organization that has given awards to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Dr. Paul Offit, a VAMIT vaccine promoter who holds a $1.5 million research chair at a Merck-funded children's hospital and holds several patents on vaccines. He's also been quoted as saying a young baby could get up to 10,000 vaccines at once. These doctors should take this reward money and give it to the thousands of girls that you can find all over YouTube who have had adverse reactions after getting the Gardasil vaccination. Gabby was diagnosed with inflammation of the central nervous system as a result to the Gardasil vaccine. She suffered from two TIAs or mini strokes. She is now vomiting on a regular basis. I had had an adverse reaction. I lost the ability to walk. Um, I started falling down, I needed help, I had head pressure, um, this is very hard to talk about. If I had never gotten this shot, I would be a normal teenager and I wish I could go back. I wish there was a way to cure this and I hope that they can figure something out, a treatment plan, but I can't plan for that. I got my second Gardasil shot in January of 2008. Now it's November of 2008. And I've had problems every day ever since. Doctors like vaccines because they will cause large percentages of the population to become lifelong customers, whether it's allergies, autoimmune diseases, or any other types of inflammation. These people will need expensive treatments and prescription drugs. And that is why you now see vaccine companies setting their sights on every Mexican girl by the year 2012. Ahora, con Gardasil, la única vacuna que protege contra los... This is Rob Dew reporting for InfoWars Nightly News. That's just devastating footage, and there's even more interviews from CBS and other major mainstream reporters on the true face of Gardasil, the victims it causes, the people it hurts. And they only claim there's, what, 4,000 deaths from cervical cancer each year, yet there's more than 18,000 adverse reactions, at least 30 deaths from the vaccine itself. Ugh. It's, it's really disgusting. For more on the debate over the safety of vaccines, we go now to expert Dr. Russell Blaylock. Uh, doctor, we spoke a year ago in depth on some of these issues, uh, but what can you tell us today about the dangers of the HPV Gardasil and Cervarix vaccines, and about the effects of vaccines in general? Well, it's well known that there's a connection between vaccination, particularly multiple vaccinations, and brain inflammation and seizures. Uh, that's been well established. It's been recently admitted by the Institute of Medicine that these are two things that are seen. Uh, so the fact that uh, Representative uh, Bachman was attacked for her statement it's rather ludicrous on the part of these uh, doctors and others that are attacking her because uh, it's backed up by the, the scientific study. And we know there's a well-defined mechanism, which I've written several papers in peer-reviewed journals describing this mechanism in detail. Now, we look at the government reporting system, the VAERS system, which is voluntary. Only 2% uh, is estimated of actual reactions are reported. But they admit uh, 18,700 adverse reactions uh, with the Gardasil vaccine. Uh, and they admit that 8,000 are serious. That is 1,400 young girls, uh, age 11 and above, have been seriously damaged by this vaccine. And that includes 68 young girls uh, who died. Uh, now again, this is a, a reporting system that's voluntary by the physicians. Uh, so we find out that actually the numbers are much higher than that. 
been estimated as 176,000 uh, entries to this vaccine, of which there's over 13,000 that are serious, and there may be as many as 600 girls that have died following this vaccine. So uh, if we look at the truth of this vaccine, we see it's a very dangerous vaccine. Now, one of the things about it is it's adjuvant, that is the immune stimulating part of the vaccine. It contains twice as much uh, brain damaging aluminum as other vaccines. And so that would explain why we're seeing so much problem with this particular vaccine. But the problem is, is the whole thing is predicated on, a, on an enormous uh, uh, deception. And that's the idea, that, and, and they're telling these girls in, their, in the doctor's office that uh, if your daughter gets an HPV infection, she's going to develop cervical cancer and probably die from it. Well, if you look at the scientific information, that's not true at all. Uh, what we actually see is that uh, death from cervical cancer is extremely rare and that the majority of women uh, who are HPV infected are not going to develop cervical cancer. And those that do, this extremely small percent, about 1% of all women uh, who develop cervical cancer, most of them are going to occur when they're uh, age 50 and above. So this 11-year-old girl that they want to vaccinate, 20-year-old girl, is not in any real danger until she's uh, in her 50s. If we look at the, the accepted statistics, 1% of women less than age 30 uh, will develop cervical cancer. Now, that's 100 cases in the entire United States. Just 9% below age 40 will develop cervical cancer. 73% of cases occur in women that are above age 50. Uh, so we're talking about preventing a, a disorder that's extremely rare. Uh, that occurs mostly in women over age 50, and yet they want to vaccinate them when they're 11 years old. Well, they've even admitted the vaccine probably will not uh, have any effectiveness at all after five years from the vaccine. So that means by the time the girl's 16 years old, uh, the vaccine is useless. There's no evidence whatsoever that this vaccine prevents cervical cancer. Uh, there's little evidence that it even reduces HPV uh, infection of the cervix, even though that's possible. We know that 90% of girls that get infected with HPV virus, it will clear by itself. In other words, they get uh, the clearing and curing of the virus by itself, without any treatment. And that only 10% is the virus persistent, and only in a small percentage of that 10% will ever develop cervical cancer. And again, it's after age 50 or around that age. Uh, so what's being told is an enormous lie that we're preventing uh, uh, death from cervical cancer by this vaccine, when none of those things seem to be true. It's not preventing the HPV that we, we've been uh, led to believe. Uh, there's, this uh, vaccine was fast-tracked went through approval within six months without adequate testing. It still has not been adequate tested. Uh, there's no evidence that prevents cervical cancer. And we know that there's a lot of other uh, uh, cofactors that HPV virus by itself, even HPV 16 type, uh, by itself cannot produce cervical cancer. It has to have cofactors. These include smoking, uh, exposure to long-term uh, birth control pills, multiple sex partners, poor hygiene, poor diet. And we find, in fact, there's some excellent studies done that show if young women consume folate, folic acid, and vitamin B12, they reduce their incidence of HPV inve infection itself 74%, which far exceeds what we've seen with this vaccine, and it reduces the incidence of cervical cancer 70%. So here you have a simple way to prevent cervical cancer in these young girls uh, without endangering them, because folic acid B12 certainly doesn't kill uh, 68 young women, uh, or that's the higher number that we discussed. Now, if you want to make something mandatory, why don't you make it mandatory that all young girls take folic acid B12 and stop smoking? Because uh, those are the leading causes of cervical cancer. And that's been proven time and again by numerous laboratories and numerous studies. Uh, and we know that this HPV vaccine 
uh, only produces uh, cervical cancer in the presence of significant folic acid B12 deficiency, and that smoking produces uh, vitamin B12 folic acid deficiency. Uh, so the whole thing is predicated on a lie. It's, it's there for nothing but producing sales for the vaccine manufacturer, the Merck Pharmaceutical Company, uh, to sell these vaccines. They're secretly going around to state legislatures trying to get mandatory laws passed, uh, like Governor Perry did. Uh, he accepted $5,000 uh, each from three different pharmaceutical vaccine manufacturers, uh, over uh, $377,000 that Merck Pharmaceutical put in the Governor's Association of Texas uh, for the, the good governor to uh, mandate this vaccine. And there was no evidence that it needed to be mandated. Uh, so this whole thing is, is just a farce, but it's a dangerous farce because they're destroying the lives of these young girls. Many of these girls are having repeated seizures. Uh, they're crippled by arthritis. Uh, they're having cognitive problems, cannot remember, cannot learn. Uh, they're having to drop out of their, their uh, sports uh, events. They're having to uh, have a lot of difficulty with their schooling. And uh, this is all being covered up, not discussed by the media. And mothers need to know, start asking some serious questions. And what they'll find out is many of these physicians know absolutely nothing about HPV infection. They know nothing about cervical uh, cancer and the relationship to HPV vaccinations. The other question is, how much influence does the big pharma industry have over politics? Why are we seeing a wave of backlash against Michelle Bachman, a political candidate's comments that HPV causes, quote, retardation, and saying there's no data when there's all the incidence reports we've just talked about? Are they playing semantical games with the definition of retardation, or are they simply denying that this is a dangerous vaccine that was allowed to be pushed on a political level? Well, it's all politics, and it's all profits for the pharmaceutical companies. And you realize the pharmaceutical companies are pumping tens of millions of dollars to these politicians. And Perry is a good example. Uh, you know, he's been promised uh, $50 million for his uh, presidential bid by uh, these pharmaceutical companies. Uh, he's gotten over $1.5 million funneled through back door for himself. Uh, and his uh, 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 chief of staff, in fact, has uh, made sure that he's gotten uh, 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 the influence of Merck Pharmaceutical throughout the whole political structure. So, uh, yes, this is, this is pure politics, but it's being paid for by the pharmaceutical companies big time. They're huge money. They have huge influence. We're talking about billions of dollars uh, in the sales of these vaccines if they're made mandatory. Now, you'll notice every time these pharmaceutical company reps or these politicians or the CDC talks about the high death rate from cervical cancer, they never talk about in the United States, it's always in the world. Well, we know in undeveloped third world nations, cervical cancer is a killer because they don't get pap smears, they have poor hygiene, they have poor dietary uh, uh, intake, they have uh, uh, immune deficiencies, and so of course they have it. But in the United States, it's extremely rare, very rare, easily controlled, 100% cure rate of uh, the early uh, detected cervical cancer, 100% cure rate. Uh, and we know that just by supplying a few vitamins, you can dramatically reduce the incidence of infection by HPV and cervical cancer. And even that many of these uh, cases of the uh, dysplasia of the cervix, that is the precancers changes, will revert back to normal in the presence of uh, giving folic acid and vitamin B12. Uh, now, all of this is well demonstrated, uh, but they cover this up because they're trying to sell vaccines and the politicians want these donations uh, uh, from these pharmaceutical companies for their political careers. Now, we've seen a lot of the victims go on television. There's been a lot of CBS reports and other things about the, the paralysis and the seizures that have happened. Uh, what about the face of those victims? Why is everything focused on Rick Perry, who's running for higher office, and how he's now sorry all these years later about mandating this vaccine, which of course had effects in other states, other parts of the world. Well, you know, again, this is what we're saying is all of these victims have no voice. The media really doesn't want to talk to them. 
because pharmaceutical companies advertise heavily uh, on all the major media. And so they don't want to lose that advertising dollar from these big pharmaceutical companies. So they try to play this down and act like, well, we just don't know if there's any connection between the vaccine. Well, you take an 11-year-old healthy girl, you vaccinate her, and within weeks she dies, or days she dies, and this happens hundreds of times. Uh, well, what do you think made her die? A, a mysterious ray from outer space? Uh, and it's ironic that in countries like India, they had one death from the vaccine and they banned it. They had sense enough to say, we got a problem here. But in the United States, there's so much money being passed around uh, to the media through the CDC, which has a strong connection to the pharmaceutical makers. Uh, all of this is covered up. And these, you know, if you've ever watched the mothers and looked at these daughters, which I've seen a number of them, uh, these girls are destroyed. I mean, their, their lives are ruined. Uh, some of them are wheelchair bound. Some of them are hospital bed bound, having repeated seizures uh, uh, many times a day, uncontrollable seizures, uh, can no longer go to school, have no future. All of this uh, with this uh, idea that we're preventing cervical cancer when, in fact, there's much safer ways to prevent cervical cancer, and the risk from this virus is far less than we're being told, and these mothers have been. I've had mothers tell me, they went to the pediatrician's office and he told them, if the, your daughter does not get this vaccine, she's gonna get cervical cancer. Now, th that doctor should be charged uh, with malpractice because that's an absolute lie. There's no evidence for that whatsoever. Uh, and there's a massive amount of evidence that says that's not true. But that girl's chance, of all women in the United States chance, of getting cervical cancer is less than 1%. It's about 0.26% chance that they will ever develop cervical cancer. Now, if she walked in the office and said, well, your daughter has a 99.8% chance that she'll never develop cervical cancer, how many would get the vaccine? And so they turn it around and say, oh, gee, there's a huge uh, connection between HPV vaccine uh, and cervical cancer when in fact that's not what the research says at all. That even when you're infected, the risk of you developing cervical cancer is extremely small, particularly if you don't smoke and you have a good diet and good hygiene and get regular pap smears, your risk of developing cervical cancer is essentially nil. And now they're pushing it on boys too. Uh, but we know we have this regulatory problem with the FDA and the CDC and the revolving door structure with the big pharma industry, uh, how do concerned citizens fight back against this? How do we take back our lives and, and inject reasonable opposition to these dangerous vaccine promotions? Well, people need to do the research, number one, and, and with the internet, it's fairly easy. You can get on there and, and uh, get these articles which show the research has been done on HPV, the, the relationship to cervical cancer. You can look it up yourself. Uh, you can get on these sites where a number of mothers have started sites who've lost their daughter to this vaccine, uh, telling these stories, showing the videotapes, uh, connecting with other uh, mothers that have gone through this horror. Uh, so it takes a lot of research. You need to do this before you just walk in there and have your daughter vaccinated. Uh, this is a, one of the most critical decisions you'll make, and it's irreversible. That's what I tell mothers. I said, when when this is done and your daughter's crippled and having seizures and her life is ruined, it's hard to turn that around. Uh, this is a life and death decision that mother has to make. And, and you shouldn't allow these physicians who are just using the data from the pharmaceutical companies. They're not using it from the research literature and what we know clinically about this disease. Uh, they're using information uh, from their societies, which are in the pocket of the pharmaceutical companies like American Academy of Pediatrics. And the CDC, you know, I have a scientist friend of mine that's been to the CDC numerous times, and they said, you walk down the hall, the walls are just plastered uh, with posters that were given to them by the, the pharmaceutical representatives. And it's extolling the virtues and safety of vaccines and they're all uh, printed, uh, these, these beautiful color 
uh, posters uh, by the pharmaceutical makers. And this is in the CDC, which is supposed to be, be independent. Well, they're not independent. Uh, they're supported by uh, heavily by the pharmaceutical companies to promote these things when they know it's a lie. It's incredible, doctor. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And we're going to turn now to other issues. Uh, thank you and goodbye. And well, that was Dr. Russell Blaylock, and he's right. It's all on record. You can look it up for yourself. The ties between industry and government are absolutely obscene, and the way they're promoting vaccines is very dangerous. So I hope people are going to take the time to look it up and realize that it takes a toll. I also hope you'll consider subscribing to the InfoWars Nightly News. We're just getting started. We're about to be bigger and badder than ever. We've hired all new reporters, and we're about to add even more people to the team. Alex is going to be back tomorrow, Tuesday, September 20th, and he's ready to rock and roll, I guarantee you. It's been an honor to sit in. I'm Aaron Dykes, and until tomorrow, this is the InfoWars Nightly News.